everybody, it's Coffee with Will, and today we're talking about, not wrong notes, but we're talking about the magic of being in the flow at a concert, whether it's chamber music, rock and roll, stadiums, or a symphonic concert, what that experience is like and how powerful it is when people come together in community, people that might be strangers are all gathering together and they feel this synchronicity being together in a room, whether it's Grateful Dead, Austin Symphony Orchestra, Miro Quartet. And I'm gonna bring my friend Charles Pruitt on board here in a minute. He's invited to be a part of this broadcast. Charles Pruitt is a longtime member of the Austin Symphony Orchestra. He's also an amazing concert cellist who has a project where he plays the music of Bach in beautiful halls around Austin, Texas. And he's got a gorgeous instrument that's centuries old that um, at the end of this video, he'll play a short sample on his cello. But first thing we're going to do here is try to get him on board. We need to get Charles on the broadcast. Charles, are you there? All right. I'm going to do a little sharing here. Can you get it uh, on your phone, Patrick? Uh, I am looking right now. I'm just trying to look at it on the laptop. Is it coming up? Do we have sound? So I, bear with us, folks, while we get a uh, sound here. That's the other one. That's the old one. Just reload me. Oh, I, yeah, I should be up there. It's the wrong. Go up. Okay. All right, we're waiting for Charles Pruitt, Charles player, a friend of mine. We're always still getting used to technology here and the pace of it. We just got to be patient. Um, it's the wrong. Charles, we're going to have Charles Pruitt, cellist with the Austin Symphony, good friend of mine for over 20 years. We met at a recording session at the recording studio owned by ZZ Top at the time. I don't even know if that is still there, but it's out near. Are we live? We're not live there. It says, I did just see what the heck? Yeah. Just reload the page. We're trying to get Charles Pruitt on here. We did it last time, so we just need a little, there we are. We just need a moment or two. And I'll tell you what, I'm going to play piano until Charles comes on board. Patrick's watching. Audio. So this is um, a piece by Grieg, which is written in four parts. See if Charles comes. <laughs> I'll hear Charles there in the background. Wow, is that really true? No, that's not right. play piano I just play okay here we go bring Charles on camera I don't really play piano on, on live broadcasts remember that <laughs> well, Charles there yeah that's me awesome hey, Paul. can you hear me you wait a minute I can't hear you hold on I have to turn up the volume here just give me a second. Yeah, is your volume on, Charles? It's... I cannot hear you. My volume's you. up. Hmm, This will be weird. a problem if we don't have volume. Okay. How much of a delay do we have? Weird. Hey, Carol. Wow. I tell you what, I can hear you on this laptop, but not on my phone. Oh, it's because yeah. we're using this mic. Do you realize that? It actually turns off 
because it's making it think there's a headphone in there. Amazing. That's the problem. So, okay. We're going to pull this on. Oh, yeah. Get that cello up. Play some pizzicato. Let me see if... Okay, good. Now we got sound back. Unless there's like a button. Is that what that is? See what the headphones okay. Right. Awesome. Hey, Charles. Hey, Will. Okay, welcome. Uh, let's start. Th let's let's start this. Let's do this for real. Okay. That that briefcase is not good. <laughs> let's put this over here. All right. All right. So, hey, welcome everybody. This is Charles Pruitt again. He's my good friend. Cellist with the Austin Symphony has a beautiful instrument. is a, is a beautiful friend. I've known him for all, over twenty years. We first met about 1998, a recording session at the ZZ Top studio in East Austin over near One World Theater. Do you still remember that session? I do. I think, uh, was were we there with Tracy? Was she also on the gig that day? Yeah. yeah. That's Let's right. Get your camera settled. Do you have, I'll, I'll wait. So yep. while you're getting that settled, I'll tell people what we're talking about. I was uh, in my car the other day. Let's see. Keep going. There we go. You got that's like better. That's okay. good. Hey, Jamie Hillboat, how's it going? Jamie's a pianist. I've done some church gigs with him in the past. Yeah. So I'll start this again once once we're all settled, because then we can edit this later to be a little more like, right. you know, tight. Yeah. Right. You ready to start? Yes, sir. Okay. Here we go. Cut. <laughs> Marker. <laughs> This is Charles Pruitt. He's a cellist with the Austin Symphony. He's a good friend of mine. I wanted to bring him on board to get another musician's perspective about the topic that we're talking today on Coffee with Will. We're live in Austin, Texas. We've got the technology working. Uh, Charles and I met about 1998 when he moved here to play with the Austin Symphony. And we met at a recording session in East Austin at the studio that was set up by ZZ Top. It was a chamber music session. It was for a recording for a singer-songwriter. And that's actually around the time that I started the project Strings Attached, which basically Strings Attached, we, it's my arrangements of singer-songwriters, my string arrangements attached to local singer-songwriters. And that kind of got started with just doing that in the studio. People calling me, asking me to do strings for, for their songs. And I had so much fun with it that I thought, hey, why don't we start doing concerts in churches and, and bring these arrangements out just beyond the recordings. And Charles, very soon after I met him in 1998, became a member of Strings Attached. We played with people like Eliza Gilkison, Sean Colvin. That was one of the highlights, I think, for me, is being a fan of Sean Colvin's music for so many years. And we actually had two cellos on that gig. We had Sean Sanders and you and uh, me. Uh, it was a full band. So Charles has been a part of a lot of the music that I've done over the years. We played so much music together. I'm so honored that uh, we're still we're still friends and we do a wedding once in a while. But I wanted to bring him on board to get his perspective on this topic and also just hear what he's doing, what's coming up with him. He's going to play a little cello at the end if you stick around for the whole thing. But I here's the topic. You. Anyway, so I was... Good. What I like to do for coffee with Will, usually it's I'm driving to work in the morning and I... My brain is just woke up and is tossing around some ideas that I want to share with people, some different perspectives. And uh, yesterday I was in the car and I was listening to a video of Lady Gaga at a giant auditorium. And she was inviting her co-star to come out, come up on stage with her for the movie, the co-star, the director of A Star is Born. Have you seen that movie, Charles? Yeah, I, I, you're, talk, you're talking about the, can you hear me well? Yep. Um, I could, by the way, I can hear you pretty well. <clears throat> and right. if it sounds like I'm over projecting, let me know, because I could, I could definitely hear no, you better good. than I need to. Okay, um, you're good. Is that better? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's yeah, there's, better. Actually, um, Facebook will make, it'll make adjustments to the levels, so it's not going to be <clears throat> too much. It's better to be a yeah, little well, louder. Yeah, well, over. Is that me or you? You're, you're dipping. Yeah, it looks like my phone just... Okay, cut. Start that one again. Yeah. If you just joined uh, us, this is Charles Pruitt, cellist with the Austin Symphony, friend of mine. And I, w I wanted to start the topic again. Hey, Peggy, how's it going? 
So the topic is, I was listening to this video of Lady Gaga bringing on Bradley Cooper, I think is his name. He's the guy that he starred and he directed A Star is Born. It's a remake. Uh, Barbara Streisand was in this movie many years ago. And it got me thinking, I got 20% left, but it got me thinking, recently I've been watching some, some uh, videos on getting in the flow state. That state that, that artists... Uh, business people, anybody, any human being can get into this flow state. That's where sort of time disappears and you don't, you know, an hour or two goes by and you're, and you think, what the heck? Two hours have gone by. I've been so absorbed in my activity and so at peace with myself. This, this flow state. Are you familiar with that, Charles? What I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I do. And, okay, and so I, I think we state. both know what that so, flow state is and it's true we, sense. Right. Yeah. And so, and, they mentioned in this training video that, is, that it can occur, at, you know, with 10,000 people at a concert, you know, with one artist leading, you know, a whole audience to sort of get into that state. These could be all strangers in an audience. And so that's very fascinating mm -hmm. to me um, that, you know, we not only as, an, as a musician who's a performer, do I get in or I like to be in that flow state performing with my musicians, but then we're sort of mirroring or we're leading people that are, that are essentially observing us to also become a part of that flow state and be in, it's kind of like a way of creating peace in the world. And it was one way to look at it. And when you provide people that experience, but what's really interesting to me is <clears throat> here's what I went with the thought. I'm watching that video of Lady Gaga and I'm thinking that that flow state is very much influenced by our past experiences and what, you know, what we find exciting, you know, in our, in our, do you have a tripod, Charles? I don't. I've, I've got no, something okay. that holds my uh, oh, phone up, but uh, it slides oh. a little bit. So you're seeing like a giant audience getting all in sync. And I was thinking that as a musician, I'm drawing from, I'm seeing the world. Basically, I'm seeing the world from all of the past experiences in my brain, all be going to music school, having mentors who taught me about what it means to be a great musician, what all that stuff. I am seeing the world with that programming in my head, right? So people like you and I, we've done gigs. This is many times, like any professional musician in Austin, we've gone, like, I'll give you an example. I played with uh, Luciano Pavarotti. I think you were in Austin when that happened, right? 1998 at the Irwin Center. And... The, a small orchestra from the Austin Lyric Opera was hired to back up Luciano Pavarotti. Now, you know, when we're, this, this is an experience to the musicians. We, we go on stage and what we're, we're so trained and have these hypersensitive ears and hypersensitive abilities to give the best performance. That's how we're seeing the music or and hearing the music. So I went on stage at the Irwin Center it's giant. Everything is, the sound just, just goes out. It's this giant wash of sound. And they have, you know, speakers on the stage. And so I'm seeing it as like, this is not that great of an experience to hear music. It's just blasting everywhere. And this is what a lot of musicians complain a lot because, and, and regular people like never invite a musician, a professional musician out to hear a concert because they're going to see the whole experience from their lens as a musician. And it's a lot of times I'll be sitting at concerts like the, I'll be on stage with Luciana Pavarotti. The sound sucks. It's not a fun experience, but we as professionals, we push through it. We know that the people that are out there, we're there to deliver, to do our job. And so we don't make it about ourselves. We do the best we can with the hope that the sound going out there and the experience is enough to bring people into that flow state. So they have an amazing experience. But what I've, what I've, been learning and what I've learning to accept is that yeah most of, if, if you're not a trained musician and you're listening to a concert they are not hearing it from the same lens that we are so they're taking in so for instance to go back to the experience of Lady Gaga that audience had seen that film they had sat in a a completely dark auditorium and yeah. got to know the characters and their dopamine was ru running. They're, all their feel-good chemicals were becoming were running through their bodies. 
the, the audience members and, and were, they were becoming attached into that experience in the dark theater. Yeah. So th that audience in the theater was in flow so that when they went to the concert, it didn't need to be great sound. All they needed to see was those actual people that were on the screen and people freak out. This is what's always made, it's been weird to me as a performer by how much people freak out to see a celebrity you know, when we're just like, that's just another human being. That's just another artist. They just do, they're just doing their thing. But if you understand where most people hear music or when they see things on TV and what goes on with the brain chemistry, it makes sense. And so knowing that also affects now how I perform rather than being so focused on perfection as an artist, of course, um, um, thanks for listening. This is the long talk, but maybe more, we need to look at the grand gesture of what the performance looks like because that's how the audience is picking it up. They're not, I mean, most of the audience is not trained musicians, okay? Now, as a side note, if you're talking about like the Austin Symphony audience, that audience might be trained to hear a certain amount of perfection, whether they hear it or not, you know, I mean, they, they just, they're going to hear if somebody's playing a little out of tune, okay? But when you go to a rock and roll concert, the sound could be horrible. I mean, you might not even be able to hear the lyrics. I went to hear um, Stevie Wonder, and again, I, I could barely hear Stevie Wonder's lyrics, but the whole 80,000 people in the Irwin Center were just in sync. Everybody was singing the lyrics. It was like a religious experience. I started to feel it, too. As, even as a trained performer, I could be sitting there complaining. I can't hear the lyrics. Everything's boomy. This is horrible. Why are people loving this? But no, it's because people had listened to that music growing up. They had childhood experiences. And to see Stevie Wonder on the stage there was a religious experience. And that is as valid as our experience as musicians sitting on stage when everything goes right. And, and for us, that's the best experience is when maybe, I don't know if this happens with you at the Austin Symphony or maybe when you're playing solo cello, but the sound is great. People are listening. You're having a good night. You're in the flow and everything matches up and everybody's having a great time. So anyway, I was just some realizations about, I, I'm, I am learning to let go more of, as when I go to a show and look at the more, more of the grand gesture when I saw the Austin Symphony um, a year ago when you were playing and you gave me tickets, um, I mean, if I took one of my string playing friends, you know, they might be complaining and bitching, you know, I couldn't hear the seconds uh, or they're not following the conductor or whatnot. Anyway, I went with a friend and I had like, a, I think I had a glass of wine. But when I engaged that experience from, wow, this is, almost a hundred acoustic musicians sitting on stage. This is such a rare experience. All of that sound is coming from human beings, flesh and bone. I, I was actually in tears a couple times during the show. It was just because it's such a rare experience in our culture now to hear acoustic music and people sitting quietly because we move so fast. So I was in tears. I, I, you know, and so I was engaging the performance from that place rather than looking for perfection and, you know, oh, the winds were out of tune or whatnot, you know. Anyway, I wanted to get your response to that, what I'm talking about. Have you experienced any of one flow or any of sort of, when, you, when you're a, a listener, can you get out of being a performer analytical mode and just enjoy, yeah. uh, because I know you've done shows with amplification, and that can be challenging. <laughs> so I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Charles. You say, you know, I've done things on a, on a what kind of location, Will? You've done shows with amplification, where oh, it ampli can be yeah, amplification. uncomfortable. Right. We're acoustic right. musicians. Our well, instruments I mean, were brought to perfection in a world without electricity. And now true. we live and, in this, yeah. Yeah, and we still, and we still uh, address the, this projection that you do with amplification that can be like, I, I even experienced that just uh, in day to day living now where, you know, just as I was commenting a little while ago, I could hear you. Well, I don't need to project my voice as much. I, I hope. Right. And, 
And, you know, and I think most of us are doing that because we have a speakerphone and we think, and then have you, have you experienced right. that? When somebody yeah. has a microphone, but they don't know the art of, uh, what is it called? Uh, well, I want to say. Oh, yeah, of, of uh, working the mic, basically. Yeah, vo vocal, vocal technique with the mic. So yeah. that if, if you are going to start to project your voice, you pull the mic away. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so this kind of comes right back to right directly into what you're talking about. And that, mm -hmm. that is a not, that's an interrupting flow when, when we have to project something it's already being heard. So if people right. are hearing us, then, and we're communicating that feeling that, that it's a, it's, it's a, it's a two, two way vibe, a give and take, mm -hmm. then, then there's a, fl a natural flow there. When we have that interruptive quality, that's uh -huh. when the flow gets disturbed. And, well, and, then, and then of course, I think that's what you're talking about too, a little while ago about how, with the digital age we're in now, we get so distracted. And, and then with the amplification, that does that too, which is why for me, the flow that, that's become more um, uh, natural has been to, 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 to play more by ear, which is why I enjoy going to Roberto's jam, which is why I enjoy playing with you because that's, that's your thing is okay. is not reading the music but it's flowing through the music well okay what i'm getting at here is here's my experience being around other professional musicians especially classical musicians i'll say this yeah mainly classical musicians mainly this is what i experienced with classical musicians they are so number one focused on their them being the center of the universe each musician right. especially classical Positions. Number one. Number two, they're so focused on perfection and things going according that that lines up with the, being the center of the universe, that this hyper focus on how and th the way things should be. OK. And yeah. what they don't realize is like even what you just said right there, um, people that are the thousand people that are sitting out there watching an Austin Symphony performance. There could be 10 musicians on stage that are angry. They're not going to have any awareness of that. Like in the orchestra, I, I, I can't say I'm playing this job. I'm not getting paid enough or, or the conductor's off. I mean, there are all these brains on stage and all those people, you know, they're having these little worlds inside their head. Mm -hmm. And classical musicians tend to do this more, I found. Um, but guess what? The audience doesn't give a shit about that. And um, matter of fact, and what I wish is, is that, that I would see more classical musicians. I'm not saying they're all like this. I just say there's a tendency um, because I've right. been around classical musicians for 20 plus years and, and played an opera for 27 years. And, and yeah. when we go on break, this is when they talk about things, this is what's talked about. Guess what? Most of that stuff they talk about, the audience has no idea. And the audience is, ha is having uh, transcendent experiences regardless of whether the second violins were totally together. What I'm trying to say is, is that if classical, more classical musicians or other musicians that have this problem could just let go of that when they have yeah. a performance. <laughs> and um, they might have a better time. Like the audience is already gonna have a good time. Sometimes what classical musicians will do is they'll make faces and they will indicate to the audience something's wrong. And yeah, sometimes yeah. the audience will pick that up. I used to do that a lot. I'm raising my hand. I'm hor I was horrible at that. <laughs> um, yeah. But um, but by playing more more improvised music and jazz music and being around people that just are just happy to be there or happy to be alive essentially um, yeah. and aren't bitching and moaning that things aren't the pr way they sh should be. Right. Um, I've slowly been brought over to this other side where when a mistake happens or an imperfection happens, we all just smile at it. So yeah, I'm, that's what I'm getting at. Like, so yeah. how do you feel that, about that? that? That reminds me, I was talking about this and, uh, you know, I played in, uh, I, I was in a cello studio studying with uh, great cellist mm -hmm. uh, Nick Rosen. And uh, that's what, that's what a lot of his friends call him Nick. His real name is Nathaniel, but uh, uh, a, a fellow student might ask him because he seems to have, have it easy, whatever he's 
doing, he doesn't doesn't get his concentration disturbed. Uh, his his focus is like a, a steel trap, and and so they say, what, what what if you make a mistake? What do you do? And he goes, well, I the thing I do, I try to make the next thing as beautiful as possible. And I think that's exactly what uh, hmm. if in the bigger sense what you're saying, you know, where right. we we're we're enraptured in and the experience and not just right. um, the micromanaging that, that we've, we've classically been trained to do, which, which is yep. why like this playing by ear, I was talking about for me, I, I wouldn't, if I wasn't practicing, I'd be listening to jazz. I could go across the street and hear, uh, you know, standards. I, I could hear a jam session with in, in a, in an old uh, jazz style uh, at a place. What was it called? Uh, Mother, Bears? No, no, that wasn't Mother Bears. It was called uh, Nature's Table. And mm -hmm. it was right across from the Cranert Center when I was at Illinois. And I could go hear that jazz and I could wind down at the end of the night with that that kind of music, that kind of artistry and, and that flow. Again, right back to what, what we were, you know, feeling in its rawest sense, you know. And, and so that's why uh, learning, trying to learn a little bit more of that that style of playing. And I think that, you know, I know the early music musicians, they, they learned, they learned some improvisation in the, in the Baroque era. And, and sure. I think that's one of the things that, you know, it, it draws them to that because it's less of the sort of wound up uh, where as we, we got later and, you know, concert halls got bigger. They started uh, raising the cycles per second from, 430 up to 440 and even more some some orchestras in germany i think tune as high as 445 and it's brighter hey, sharper Carl. yeah yeah what what does that mean somebody that's not a musician out there you're talking cycles and all that well, is that, that, well what, what, it, what it means is is it means is that and how that's um, related to being a flow and all that yeah well it for for the practice of uh, you know getting the music out to the audience we're having uh, to uh, not let it fall sharp, support the sound, fall flat, support what the does sound. That mean? By, if well, you're not a musician, what is being in tune, flat just mean? being in tune, just like okay, great. just being in tune, so, being connected with your sound. That that's what it's all about, and and it really is. Uh, as again, as you said before, not as important to to the audience, but here this flow that we're talking about, getting music to connect with others connect with you and and then 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 we're in a flow that's that's where it's that's where it's most beautiful and that's where it's most spontaneous mm -hmm. and what does yeah. that look like for you like you, recently charles did a solo cello concert at a, at a cathedral in austin and uh he had a good turnout and here you are yeah. basically filling vibrating the molecules of air in that room for a couple of hours keeping people or, or inviting people to be, to focus on being in the present moment by vibrating the air. This takes people back yeah. to a time when that music was written. It was enough for a cello. It was enough for a piano. It was enough for a few musicians to get together and entertain each other for many hours. And so what was that experience like? Uh, can you just give me like 60 to seconds, two minutes on if you can almost think back what did you experience at that solo concert with regard to flow like is there anything you can relate to the casual listener or not the casual listener but the non-musician who might be watching this well I'm, I'm i for me i'm hearing i'm hearing the music just as a, just as somebody in the audience is hearing the music in the back of the hall there's a they're hearing it the cello sound come to them and i'm doing the same thing from the other end i'm hearing the sound carry in a rather big space. Oh, nice! And, and by taking the time to hear that arrive, then I then I know what's a good tempo. That would be like a, a we call that a wet acoustic. It's it's not a, sh a short where the sound decays quickly. No, it, it keeps ringing. Yeah. And because cool. of that wet acoustic, I can take a little more time to feel the sound and you know, stay in the moment what I'm doing with the music, but but trying to, to hear 
how it's filling the space. And that, and that's how I'm, that's why I feel like I'm in my flow and, and a room that big and a nice old high ceiling, uh, space. And, and that's, that's where, that's where I'm, that's where I'm comfortable. That's where I feel like I'm in a flow. And I feel like, uh, the music. What kind of emotions come up for you, Charles, when you're playing uh, solo cello? What do you feel in your heart and your brain and your soul? I'm, I'm curious what, what's going on I, there. I, I feel, I feel, uh, like the, the arch of the Bach, music. Yeah. yeah. When I'm playing Bach, I feel the arch, it, there's a definite form and there's a, an arc that the sound is going. And I'm, I'm, I'm thinking first about what, I mean, I, here, obviously I'm talking about what I'm thinking about, but I feel yeah, what I'm feeling about your emotions. Yeah. Yeah. What I'm feeling in that is, is an earthiness, an earthy quality, okay. a, very, uh -huh. a very grounding quality, uh, a nurturing sound and warmth. And nice. uh, it, it feels good just to be in that, that wash of sound. And that, that's like a, it's a, it's like a safe place where you don't even, you don't even, nerves don't even come in there. They, you, you just feel. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. You just feel you're, you're, it's like you're being carried by the music itself. The music is just taking you there. You know, that's what it it's feels like. like a to space. Me. Is it sort yeah. of a space that, and um, because that space is very familiar to you, you've gone to that space for many, 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 many years. Yeah. I'm guessing yeah. that when you pick your instrument up and even just start playing a little bit of that Bach, it takes you there pretty quickly, right? Almost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I think that's why Casals probably played Bach every day is that he was connecting with that, you know. That's nice. It wasn't an exercise. I, wow. See, and that's and that's a great thing for musicians to understand is that not maybe not all composers or not all music is going to take them to that space. And in a way, part of their their learning experience will be to find those composers, those pieces of music, those styles, you know, which can, which can take them there quicker. And then then they can get that familiarity with that space. I know I have that experience. Um, with like, I'm very comfortable just improvising from nothing from just, I can just say D major, let's go. And that is a very comfortable, it's actually more, it's more comfortable for me to make something up completely from no, nothing yeah. than to play something on the page. It's, I, I have to admit. It's, you know, and, in, and I have to say, I'm doing the same thing you're doing, but you're within feeling? the structure. I, yeah. it, can be, oh, okay. it can be a little bit different each time. Sure. But, and, I, and, and I get what you're saying about Bach, because I feel that way about Bach, too. There's some pieces that I play in a Bach that basically there's a sense that every single note from one note to the next, that's the way it will, it's supposed to un unfold. There's no other way that it could have unfolded. It, there's an exercise that my teacher used to say, he's like, for composition, he'd say, why don't you try to rewrite this Mozart? Let's see if you can make it better. And it was, a, take a little phrase of Mozart and try to write another, mel take the melody and go off on another path. It's really hard with Bach or Mozart to actually come up with something. It's almost impossible. So for me, when I'm playing it, it's just, there's no, there's no extraneous, especially Bach, right? There's no, no, that's kind of like filler there. You know what I mean? It's, there's no filler yeah. music. I guess what's I guess what cellists have that uh, that a higher instrument don't have is that y you sort of have a responsibility to fill the bottom up and, and right. keep it resonating, and so you you take a little bit more extra time and care to to send that out <laughs> and, and give it nice you know, fill that fill that space you know yeah it's it's the cello I mean. The, I can't tell you how many times I meet people and they say, oh, I love the cello. It's my favorite instrument. I know. Well, it's the closest to the human voice, the, the registered you. cello. Yeah. Yeah, maybe a male voice. Duh. Yeah, it's right. Like or, a lower, or a lower uh, voice in general, you know. Like, here's resonant. the lowest note on the cello. Can you hear this? Uh, can you sing that? <laughs> you got your yeah. cello right there. That's good. Get it in the pit. You know, if you have that in in the picture, that's going to attract more viewers. So, yes, it's so it definitely yeah. Has... There's what? No, go ahead. You you go ahead. Oh, there's something. I mean, no, the cello tone sits in a range that's very pleasing. 
It's, 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 I mean, you could say it's warm, it's comforting. I like your phrase that you, you said it was earthy. That's, that's, it's grounded. Um, and so while we um, sort of uh, wrap up here, but uh, I, mean, I love what you had to say about just sharing your experience of what it's like to be a performer on the stage. That, see, from an audience perspective, like having that information next time I go see you, I know that 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 takes my experience to another level. Just having that information. Oh, Charles is up there. He's going into his zone. He's going into the flow. He's going into a safe spot where he feels safe. Wow. And that, you know, how you're hearing the, the sound come back to you. Um, I, this reminds me of Pat Metheny. Pat Metheny is a great jazz guitarist <coughs> that yeah. I followed for many years since I was in high school. He said, I play, I like to play a solo as if I were listening to it. <clears throat> what would I like to hear? He goes, what would I like to hear? I mean, and if you think about that, how is that possible for a musician? Okay, you're on there, you're playing. How are you able to be the, the person that's creating this, but also observing it? But that, that happens, right? If, when, you, when you get good at your instrument, Another artist, uh, Kenny Werner, talks about he's, he watches his hands do their thing. He's not in there when you get to a certain level of familiarity, right? He's not in there like trying to make the fingers move. It actually starts to flow where you can watch this and you can be an observer. That's what Pat Metheny was talking about. You're kind of talking about it. You're hinting at it, too, because that, that music is very familiar to you. That Bach you've been playing for 30 plus years, right? You're right. Yeah. Yeah. And, it's, uh, and uh, this is information that's helpful for an audience to know. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's transcendent. And uh, I think when that guy is looking at his fingers, he, you could almost say he's, he's stepping outside. Have you ever been like maybe in a competitive, like you're playing in a contest or you're in an audition and your focus is so, um, it, it's just so laser or tunnel mm. vision or with your blinders on that nothing can can interfere with what is happening in that moment and and wow. then that's it's, it's like it's almost like your your subconscious mind is is now talking to you and you can hear it babbling on or, or going somewhere and it, yep. but you're so caught up in what you're doing that yep. that your mind has the ability to 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 to, to literally sort of free free fall a little bit, you know, the, that space that is, is now just unlocked because it's almost like yep. hypnotic. It's like a, yeah. Almost like a, yeah, it's, it's, like, a, know, it's one, like an added time space dimension. Right. And one thing I want to tell people is that this isn't necessarily a talent. I mean, the talent is in the ability to know this is possible for every, any human being. This is a human ability. And the talent is being able to sit in discomfort for many days and hours and years and to develop this, like the 10,000 hour idea, you know, and, and to find joy in this. I mean, there's joy built into playing music. It feels good. You know, there, there is a bit of joy there. You're sharing something. Um, but we're not any, you know, we don't have something that anybody who's watching this has, doesn't have access to. Everybody has access to, to this, what we're talking about. Maybe it's not music. Maybe music isn't the place where you find it, but um, every human has, has the ability. And I encourage folks to not think of us as separate, but that I you know, just want to bring the, the word that this is a really great way that humans can connect to one another in flow, yeah. in, you know, right? Yeah, definitely. There's a community there that... Um we we feel with the audience that is celebrating it with us when when you can when you can share that with everyone that exactly. feels the best like especially when we go to to do an outreach concert all um, right or when you play for young children who are who are just so uh, excited and and you, I know you isn't that great feel, yeah it's wonderful isn't it it really it reminds yeah. you how how fun things can be Exactly, and, and you and, and you get it, that brings it brings more joy to what we do. Yeah, and the I, the irony, the other side of that, the sort of 
mirror image of that, the yin and yang. It's, it's just really interesting to me that when you dedicate yourself to doing this for a living or as your primary focus of like how I'm going to work on, you know, a skill um, and you go to school and you start to do it for a living, you start to see this side. I've seen this in myself. You know, there's a, a pathway that can get really jaded and a lot of musicians because you'll be around these musicians um, for some reason in Austin, I don't know why, but you know, there's just a lot, there are a lot, there are a lot of, there's a lot of negative, you know, talk. Um, I don't know if this is the way, way it is everywhere, uh, you know, but if it's a different, is it different in Europe? But I, I've definitely had teachers that are just overflowing and joy and positive And, you know, at the mm -hmm. same time are still will push you, you know, but it's really interesting to me that especially in classical music, or maybe any kind of side of music where there's like a doctrine or there's sort of some kind of teaching that, you know, you know what I'm saying? This is, it's probably happened for hundreds of years and it's too bad, but, and I, I would just suggest that young musicians and people that are, they, if they're in that place right now where they feel negative and that, that doesn't have to be that way, you know, that they can literally shift their consciousness just like that. And, yeah, like you've been around me when I've been there. I have been there. Yeah, like sure, oh my sure. Oh my God, I'm playing a wedding. It sucks. You know, why am I playing <laughs> weddings? Why am I doing, you know? Um, oh, and part pressure. of this is choosing for yourself too. What what is it that you want to create in the world as a artist, as a musician, as a community builder, and and then finding like, well, um, maybe I don't vibrate as much on the weddings, but I mean, maybe I vibrate better over here. And they're nothing against weddings, you know. Matter of fact, right. I've had some great weddings where we, you know, we're playing the same music over and over and over and over again. But here's another, this is, this relates back to what I'm talking about at the beginning of the video. Just because our experiences as the creator of the music, like that music is Pachelbel's canon. It's, it, we, it's, it is, it's cliche for us, but somebody yeah. hearing it for the first time, is like the most amazing music in the world. So we have to be we have to be careful to keep that to ourselves. That's that's what I think. And if we're playing Pachelbel's Canon, and some kid hears it for the first time, we it's not we don't need to color it for them. It's not right. bad music. And just because no. our sound sucks, right? This is this is what I'm saying about about you know. And you find this in musicians usually in their twenties, but right. between like twenty and thirty five you know, these young classical musicians, you know, I can name names right now, but they each, they either get more negative and more jaded or they, there's something switches and around 40, 45, they go, you know what? I'm just going to enjoy this. And, and they just start. <laughs> and they, cause I, I bet you could name people that we know in the orchestras that have switched over to that more positive thing. They're not, and we knew them when they were in their 20s. I, I can say myself, I'm one of those in my 20s. I mean, I ran strings attached. You know, I got really stressed out. I was just like, because things wouldn't go the way I dreamed them to be in my head, it would create a lot of stress. And I didn't have control over the players, you know. And it's, yeah. that that's, nobody, t I wasn't taught as a musician. Oh, well, you're going to be a leader someday. Here's a skill that you might need. The skill is... Is, is, is it's an art, you know, because it's you walk this line, you have to have, a, you have to have a little bit of, you have to have judgment, but you don't want to cling too much to the judgment. Otherwise, you're going to create this negative experience. And then it's going to go out to everybody else. I'm just I'm kind of recovering from that actually from just my teachers and what I learned from classical music is, is that you got to push, you have to be competitive, you have to, you know, struggle, you know, and I think they, they go overboard with that a little bit. I still think it, they go overboard. I see musicians. I don't mean to go on and on in this video, but it's it's crazy how much the classical people go overboard with that the yeah. competition thing. Yeah, I think. I mean, as, as an older player, and you know, I work with obviously people who are much younger, getting getting kind of getting their feet wet, and you can feel that sort of competitive vibe going on. Or and, and yeah. it's not necessarily competing with with you know a stamp partner or anybody else but it's it's competing with the standard that they're trying to uphold they're, they that's feel, it right you know, yeah they feel the the pressure that you have to really rise to the occasion 
and it's got to be exactly like it's going on around you. And maybe it doesn't. Maybe, maybe. Uh, it, yeah, Andrew. In fact, I remember, there was a guy who was director at the UT School of Music when I first got here. I think his name was Ron. Was it named Ron Crutcher, maybe? And he 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 was a cellist. So I thought, right. oh, I should go play for, yeah. I should go play for the guy. And, and so I did. But his comment about living in Germany, doing music there, is that, that they didn't care about mistakes there in Germany. Isn't that interesting? Like, oh, there's wow. so, so many orchestras, probably of varying levels, like we have here. Some people aren't, aren't all professional musicians, so we, we have some orchestras yep. that are not fully paid, not fully professional. And heck, the, Host the Austin Symphony is not even full time. Uh, but what what it what does happen is fully professional, uh, but but you know this this idea that you know you you can have great musicians and they they don't they're not necessarily lost and you know chasing perfection there that they're that they are yeah. really just making music. That's it. Music. Yep. Yeah, Beethoven yeah. said something about that. To make a mistake is irrelevant but to play without passion is unforgivable or something like that. Beethoven said that. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, I, I, I often wonder like, what would it be like if we could time travel and hear what was the performance level like the, of perfection, you know, technical perfection at the time when Beethoven, what would, you know, with his musicians performing, uh, what would it have been like, you know? I'd be curious. There's no way to know. There's no way to yeah, know. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, yeah. I mean, if we look at their like early 20th century recordings, it was pretty amazing. Like the stuff with uh, if you're to Fort Wangler or like Freak Shy, those con uh, conductors from around the 20s and 30s. I mean, the the level of perfection was crazy. I mean, the intonation I mean, it's like unheard of. So yeah, it's probably and, and, great. And, and those conductors didn't play one note, did they? <laughs> I know. They only went out, right? That that, that, well, you that know what? We got to let's let's I want to get you on the cello for those of you. That yeah, play something. Sure. Um, Charles has got a gig coming up. He's going to tell you where his website is and um, just give him a little intro and then play a little cello. Um, thanks for doing this, Charles. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. I'd well, love to keep yeah, talking. The, but <laughs> it's the the, the, okay. the next Bach Suite concert. Uh, this one is around the world in Bach. We'll we'll also have a saxophonist on the second half, uh, Joshua Thompson and, and uh, vocalist Julie Slim. And we'll, we'll do some world music on that concert. Uh, with what Slim date Bach. and where? Uh, it's going to be at Central Presbyterian Church, March 24th at 5.30 p.m. At, you know, which awesome. is at 200 East 8th Street. Mm -hmm. I think it's near the corner of 8th and Brazos downtown. Yeah. yeah. If I come, can I bring my fiddle? Are you going to have some jamming? Oh, yeah. Bring, bring it. Bring it, Rip. Bring your okay. fiddle, Will. I will. March 24th. What day of the week is that? That's a Sunday. So I'm doing oh, cool. a, it's an early start on a Sunday because okay. who knows? Maybe people are tired from church in the morning or they got to go home and get ready for their day on, on Monday. It's their work week starting up again. Mm -hmm. Sounds great. But yeah, here, I'll play some uh, of the one of the Bach uh, suite movements for that concert. Okay, do it. Okay, I'm going to turn this that way and see if I wish there was a way I could release the picture on me and just show you. But yeah. Oh, good. You got it set up. Great. Books on a bookshelf. That's so good to see. Okay, I'm going to get out of the picture and just give it to you. Okie dokie. So your, your cello again, you got a, uh, two, your cello is about two centuries old, right? It's uh, made in 1850. From Prague. This is a new piece. I haven't heard this before. What's this? <laughs> tuning, tuning, and, and 440. And 
And no, Charles is not left-handed. That is an issue with the iPhone. <laughs> so. Yep. It's the prelude to suite number two in D minor by J.S. Bach. Okay. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
E minor, the saddest of all keys. Yes. Second suite in D minor. You, you, you didn't get my joke? No, what did you say? I said D minor, the saddest of all keys. <laughs> you seen that movie? No, no, Actually, I haven't. What movie is that? I'm not sure. I'll let the audience figure out. D minor, the saddest of all keys. <laughs> the guy that, that was Meathead in, he directed oh. that movie. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Rock Rob Ryan. Ryan. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Spinal, uh, yeah, Spinal Tap? Spinal Tap. That's right. <laughs> you just played in D minor. Well, why not C minor? Okay. B, D yeah, why minor. not B minor? You know, the ant that goes to 11, right? <laughs> okay, uh, Charles is, I'm so thankful for meeting up with me. We're going to do more of these. So thanks for uh, watching our yeah sort of get the hang of the things here and support him charles pruitt cello where's your website charles pruitt.com that's spelled P -R -E. also check out strings attached cares.org where you can donate yeah. charles goes out and plays with me at all that's kinds right. of places like for kids and rest homes and what else have we done um nursing homes recording sessions yeah, um, we're in the middle of the a recording session with me about three months ago, I think. OK, it was yeah, great. And, uh, I'm going to press off and share this as, as many places as you can, Charles, after you get right. out of here. Let's not forget okay. Strings in the Woods. Yeah, Strings in the Woods coming up. we got Strings in the Woods this Saturday, if you are just tuning in. And you can go to Facebook and just type in Strings in the Woods, and the events should be up there. All right, I'll see you soon, Charles. OK, well, thanks. Let's see what I can do here. I, I think I'll press. Oh, Cindy Litton was watching the whole thing, so that was great. Hey, Cindy. It's good. good to hear so everybody. It's good to go. Listening. Just in, in a con conclusion here, it's good to go on. If there are any comments, people are commenting about you or whatever, just say thanks and come to my show, yeah. all that kind of stuff. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks, Will. All right, see you, Charles. Appreciate okay, it. Okay, see you. All right, appreciate take care, it, man. Take care. Bye bye. Let's see if I can get this off.